Kristen Hall. Kristen received a Bachelor in Wildlife Biology from the University of Montana, worked multiple temporary field jobs, earned a master's degree in conservation biology and sustainable development from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and has been working in the conservation field for a couple of decades now. She has worked in a variety of places for a variety of organizations, including agencies, universities, and nonprofit organizations. Throughout her career, her primary muse has been birds with habitat protection enhancement at the core. She has done invasive species work in Hawaii, endangered species work for the military in California, and spent 10 years with Audubon building partnerships and collaborations for important bird areas. She is currently the State Wildlife Action Plan Coordinator for the Minnesota DNR and feels fortunate to have a great job and a great team to work with. Kristen will talk to us about a raptor review and a little research too. And uh, thank you very much, Kristen. Um, it's all you and I'll mute us and you can unmute. Okay, can you see uh, Kestrel? Thumbs up, okay, I'm getting the thumbs up, I, awesome. I've got two screens, so I'm gonna be looking all around, but thank you. Um, Ma'am, this has been such a fun morning. It is awesome to not only kind of get together with uh, fellow bird enthusiasts, but also to recognize the scope and depth of the information we have in the birding community about the species we care about so much. Um, working with the DNR in the last four years or so and working in the non-game program, I have really come to realize how good we have it. Um, bird knowledge and bird information and bird technology and bird um, song, bird sight, everything about our little package of species is just so above and beyond what we have for insects, what we have for um, all sorts of those secretive critters that we're still learning a ton about. Um, it would blow my mind to see a app about mollusks. You know, it's just amazing. The stuff that just this talk this morning has um, brought to my attention, it's been super fun. So I appreciate being here and I really appreciate the previous speakers from getting my bag ready. I am lucky to get out of the house with my binoculars most of the time. So I love that talk. I also loved the audio one because I am really horrible at hearing and that was so fun. Sharon's talk, she always blows me away. So, um, and Bill and Cavities, I love dead trees too. So it's been really great. Um, when I was asked to talk, I wondered what am I gonna contribute to this, <laughs> this call? Because I'm kind of a generalist and um, I do, I, I just have curiosity. I am um, part of an awesome birding group, the Larks, and they are just like, far and away my ears, eyes, and knowledge base. So um, I can't recommend them more, but you can't have them as an app, they're real people. Um, so my, my kind of niche in that group and what I went to for this talk is raptors. I've um, been fortunate enough in my past career to work with visual species. I've worked with cranes, swans, um, eagles, and a lot of beauties. And the reason for that is because I don't hear very well. And so I've just been kind of gravitating toward what I can do. And I um, happen to be able to see, and I've had the real good fortune of being able to drive the countryside for years, um, searching for raptors. Raptors wintering in Montana specifically um, was a long time job of mine. But because of that experience, I can't drive down the road now without like, oh, there's this, there's that. Like, it's just part of the practice and part of the thing that gets me, um, it's just kind of part of my DNA now. So my overview for this talk real quick is I'm gonna give a quick refresher in a, on a little bit of Raptor ID. Um, I am not but in any way, shape or form the expert. And I also don't have a lot of great pictures like Garrett's pictures are, Phenomenal. I don't have those. I barely have my binoculars with me, let alone a camera. So um, I didn't want to just borrow pictures from the web. I do have a little example of some comparisons that I'm going to use Cornell for later in the talk, but I'm not going to dig into Raptors 101. I'm going to give you a couple of resources and talk about how I've done Raptors in the past. Um, if there are further questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Then I'm going to switch gears to talk about one specific Raptor that we're doing research on in Minnesota, 
in partnership with quite a few folks that are on this call, um, namely Jen and Carpenter Nature Center, NRI, Saxon guys. So um, super fun stuff that we're working on right now that I want to share with this group in particular because it actually is growing um, our capacity in the Midwest to research smaller birds on a larger scale. Some really exciting stuff, so not just kestrels. My uh, book that I used to cut my teeth for raptors was uh, the Clark and Wheeler Photographic Guide to North American Raptors, and I am purposely giving a picture of the first edition um, because it's got a rough leg on it, and that was where I worked, or the species I worked with in Montana, um, and it's just a great photo. But that guide has been updated, and um, the, there are newer versions out there. Typically, photographic guides are not necessarily the ones we want to go towards for basic field guides, um, but I would say for raptors, um, photographic guides are super helpful because there are so many more, so many subtle differences um, where you can kind of be like, ah, that's not quite the, you know, diagnostic view that I see in the drawn field guide. Um, likewise, there are things like silhouettes that are super important. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go through what we can see in Minnesota, and um, if I miss any of these guys, you can let me know. I even wrote down a cheat sheet because I didn't want to miss anybody. Um, we've got two eagles that occur in Minnesota. I've got a puppy who's decided to sing while I'm talking, so I apologize for that. I hope she hasn't interfered too much. Um, we have two eagles, the bald eagle and the golden eagle. We also have uh, about six budios that can be found in Minnesota, and those are our open area hawks or our grassland hawks, um, red-shouldered hawk, red-tailed hawk, uh, ferruginous hawk, which can be seen in the western portion of the state, um, not the most common hawk that we have for sure, broadwing hawk, um, let me make sure I'm not, oh, and of course the rough-legged hawk, and the swingsons hawk. And I have to say, this is my favorite time of year because I do believe it was early April up in the northwest portion of the state, of the Tallgrass Aspen Parkland area, on a birding trip with the larks. We saw both the Swainsons and a rough legged hawk on the same trip. And that isn't, that's like two ships passing in the night. They're summer hawk, winter hawk in this world, and um, they don't use the same habitat very often. So that was a huge highlight, one I'll always remember. Um, and they can be seen at the same time, but only in these fun, real um, great migratory windows. We also have three occipiters in the state. Um, the sharp shinned hawk, Cooper's hawk, and northern goss hawk. And those guys, for me, are the hardest because I've worked with budios in the past or an open um, habitat. So occipiters is what I'm going to dig into a couple fun tips that I've found helpful. And then, of course, the falcons. And... Typically, we've got three falcons that we can see very easily um, in all of Minnesota, and that's the merlins, the kestrels, and the peregrines, even now. Um, peregrines weren't that easy to see not that long ago, but they've made a great return, and we can see them. Um, I had a friend report one of their first sightings just last week, so the first of the year uh, texts are passing back and forth, which are really fun. Um, the other two falcons are the prairie falcon, um, similar to the ferruginous. You can see it in the western portion of the state, not that common. Um, maybe, you know, uh, venture into the greater portion of the state, but not that often. And then the deer falcon, which you can see in the northern portion of the state. Also not that common, but um, one of the great winter visitors and um, just a gorgeous bird. Um, and then I can't put these guys in groups, but we also have vultures. We have the osprey, of course, which is an iconic bird that is a really nice uh, bellwether of spring and summer here, and then the Northern Harrier, which um, if seen far away, its silhouette can throw you for sure. So that brings me to silhouettes. And this is um, just a, a real simple drawing that I borrowed from the Raptor Resource Group online. And um, it's, not, it's, it's not technical at all, but it gives you a really nice visual context of what you might be seeing on a far away um, field and just even in your binoculars. You might not get any of those uh, plumage diagnostics. You might not get the back curve of the wing. Uh, you might just get like, how are they holding their wings? How long is the tail? How are they soaring? Those types of things. And I found this 
um, silhouette guide to be really helpful, mostly because and I don't know if you can see my pointer or my arrow, but mostly because they also show you like the flat horizontal view as well as a view from below or if you might see it if it turns. And that flat view is super important because it shows you kind of how they hold their wings. And like I said, those Harriers, they are actually pretty easy to identify by their flight, but they can be confused with a turkey vulture because they both have that dihedral, they hold their wings in a dihedral um, manner, which is a V shape. So vulture, V is for vulture, that's an easy one to remember. Um, and typically you can see and assume it's mostly a vulture, but there are other birds that can put their wings in a dihedral. And depending on the weather, um, some birds tuck their wings and they can kind of hide the, themselves as a falcon and they're not. So um, you never know what the conditions are gonna have birds, these raptors doing. Harriers more, and I'm gonna use my hand here, they kind of have that moth-like flight. So they push themselves up and they their wings pop up like this. Um, Short-eared owls are known for that as well. And it's just this fun flight to watch over fields and over marshes. Um, so if you, I will say one thing about my birding style is that I love to just sit and kind of watch. I'm, I'm not a quick, here it is, and this is this is what I saw. I'm more like, oh, what is it doing? How's it eating? What, how's it flying? Where is it holding its wing? Is it gonna catch something? Um, and that's just based on my experience in the field. I had to watch rough-legged hawks catch small mammals for hours on end in the field. So just got used to that way of birding and, it, and it's really paid off. It's been super fun to be able to kind of tease out these little things. Another bird that has a really great um, line of sight or flat level profile is the osprey. It's, a, it's always the M, it's always got that little elbow crick in it. Um, so you can see it from afar and sometimes they look bigger than they actually are. And you're like, what is that? Is, is that an eagle? Is that, and then you, ah, uh, that little crick in the wing always is diagnostic of being an osprey. So these are, this is for like, I can see a speck in the sky or I see this kettle of um, soaring birds. What are they? Is it a mixed kettle? Is it all turkey vultures, which I saw about 20 of the other day in Stillwater. It was very fun and reminded me that spring is coming and the mud will dry up. Um, and then we have eagles and they actually have, I was going to spend a little bit of time just talking about the difference between our um, bald eagles and golden eagles, but then I thought this talk is going to go on forever. So um, there are morphs that I could talk about. There's all sorts of things, but bald eagle silhouettes or bald eagle flying as compared to golden eagle flying can be differentiated um, fairly easily, mostly by how their head protrudes from their body. It's a lot bald eagles, their head protrudes a lot more than a golden eagle, and they just look like they have this big snout. Um, it's the best way to describe it. Although if you've seen a stellar sea eagle, which potentially we have the opportunity to do now that there's been the one sighted in the East um, Atlantic Sea for a while now, um, they have quite a snout. Like that snout is far and away beyond what the, the bald eagle is, but I'm focusing on Minnesota. So that's just a really quick, like this is a super handy little pocket guide. You could put that little thing in your pocket and be like, oh, this will help me when I'm seeing soaring birds and they're, you know, just a glimpse and from far away. Another guide that I found, see, I am not tech savvy like Sharon either. I'm like, what, what can I fold up and put in my pocket? What can I leave in my car and dig through my glove box and find? Um, this has been a really handy two-pager field guide and I have the um, URL to it later on in the talk. Um, that just shows silhouettes and some of the diagnostic um, features of various hawks, North American hawks, that you can refer to really easily. So if you're, you don't have your phone, the battery's dead, you don't have all the slick apps, and you're just like, oh, this is going to drive me crazy. What is this bird? This little two-pager is super easy um, to use and just has all those real quick highlighted points. So credit to um, the Hawk Migration Association of North America for having this, it's on their website and you can print it out and have one um, for yourself as well. <clears throat> this is the part that um, they have a little cut out at the bottom of that um, two pager that I just showed you that shows the differences between uh, Sharpie and a Coopers. And I have to say, um, yes, 
Northern goshawks are occipiters and on a quick glint through the forest, you might be like, what was that? But they, I'll describe them as having a buteo body with a um, occipiter tail. They're, they're just thick. They're bigger than either of these two. And they, they kind of command you like, oh, that was, that was an occipiter for sure. And it's definitely a goshawk. Um, there's a lot of diagnostic features about goshawks that we could go into in the plumage and their eye color, all sorts of things. But these two throw me all the time. I typically guess um, because you get a glimpse and you're like, well, it's about that time of year. Or, oh, I've seen a Cooper's here a lot. And you kind of base it on habitat and where you've been. But this little drawing is super helpful, has been super helpful to me in like oh, there are some really key differences. I used to just know the differences of the tail, like that it's sharp or a cut for a sharp shin, and it's kind of got that U or C shape for a Cooper's. That's been a really easy kind of mnemonic feature that I used in my head. Um, I love the cross and the T version. I think that was really helpful for me. And also the head protrusion from the body, similar to the difference between eagles, the head protrusion from the body is really diagnostic on these guys as well. If you see them perching, um, I'm gonna jump out of my PowerPoint and try to be as smooth as Sharon was on this and jump into uh, just comparisons online. So this is all about birds by Cornell and let me know, are you seeing a web page? Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so this is a side-by-side -side comparison of a uh, Sharpshin perched and a Cooper's perched. And they're, they do really look similar, but you, you can see a difference in it. And it's even in their profile. There's just, the Cooper's has a really flat head and the Sharpie is kind of smooth. So smooth Sharpie is a good way. I'm, I'm all about alliteration and remembering things and cut Cooper's. So it's this real cut right there on its head. And also their coloring and um, just kind of size. Typically, birds don't work for you and perch next to each other and be like, see, I'm a lot smaller than this one. They, it's very rare that you would find that. You can see it in uh, sexual dimor dimorphism for sure. If you've got two red tails together, that's the best because you're like, oh, there's the male and female. And you can really see the difference. Um, so this is just a nice side-by-side -side photo comparison that um, I wanted to point out. The next bit, I'll stay online for just a second because there are some species of raptors that are really easy to tell apart by um, gender or by sex. And we, I can think of three sexually dimorphic raptors that we will see in Minnesota. Um, the rest are more size. So um, they call it reverse sexual dimorphism where the female is always larger than the male in raptors. Um, reverse of the human condition. I guess everything is based on us when we name things. So typically females are smaller than males in mammals. For birds, it's opposite. Um, for the plumages though, there are some raptors that display sexual dimorphism in their plumage. And this is an example, um, again, from All About Birds at Cornell of a light morph uh, male rough-legged hawk. And these differences actually were not they were notified or identified probably 20 years ago or so. I was part of a team that worked on photos that diagnosed these differences. And they really do have a, a distinct, the males have a double tail band and they have this modely, um, when they're perched, it kind of looks like a vest rather than a full on belly band. And this photo is, you could look at it quickly and say like, oh, that's the female but it actually is a juvenile. So a juvenile doesn't quite display the sexual dimorphism until their first molt. And that belly band is definitely diagnostic of a female, but you can tell it's a juvie because it doesn't have a tail band and it has a light eye. So um, if you get a close enough view with your scope or the bird is really uh, working with you, you can, you can tell that it's a juvenile. And I think there's a good, this is a, just a quick photo, it's a video, but that's, the photo on that Clark and Wheeler photo guide is a female adult rough-legged hawk, and it's got that big old terminal tail band, um, it's, and it's a rich chocolatey color. So they're um, super easy to tell the difference between those two if you look at them often enough in the field. 
Kestrels are also an example of a raptor that are sexually dimorphic. Um, the male is quite colorful, very dapper. Um, I have a huge soft pot in my heart for kestrels. They're my favorite bird. And I know you're not supposed to say that because all your children are great, but they're really my favorite bird. And then this is a female. Um, also beautiful, but not quite as sharp. But she's got these just lovely rusty colors that are great in that gray blue, um, but quite different. And you can really tell the difference between them when you see them in the field. Um, if you're like, gosh, that's really small, but not as kestrel-like as I think, think about a female or maybe a juvenile that um, could be out there. And then the last one that is um, a really nice sexually dimorphic bird is the harrier. And the harrier is a um, super cool uh, owl-like face, marsh bird. You'll find it in marsh type habitats and it has that moth-like flight. Um, but the female is typically brown, broad tail band. They also have a juvenile phase that is distinguishable. Um, this is a great photo showing this like cinnamon belly that they can have. So both male or both females and juvies can have that brown overall color, but the um, females don't really have this cinnamon wash. And then, I, oh, this is my male. And they're like the marsh ghosts. They are gray and um, they just kind of whisper across the marsh. They're very beautiful and they've got that really distinct um, black wing tip. So, Thank you, Cornell, for having awesome pictures that I could share with you, because I don't take good pictures. And I'll jump back to my PowerPoint. I hope this transition works. Thumbs up if I'm back on my PowerPoint. Excellent, thank you. Um, so that this is just to go through that little quick thing I, I did online showing you a little bit of the differences in the, um, the great features that Cornell has just within their All About Birds web websites that you can do those comparisons or look at difference in plumage. Um, there's just so much you can spend time on looking at these birds. I'm gonna get into my slideshow, so I'll show you the whole thing. I don't wanna give you any previews. So that is the quick and dirty raptor review. Um, there are a ton of resources out there that I can point you to. I will say in Minnesota, we're super lucky to have Hawk Ridge and I just have the website featured here. Um, it's a fun place to go up and practice your Hawk ID, and both in flight, up close. They, they often trap during migration and will bring birds down for people to see in the hand, um, which is a really amazing experience. Duluth and that uh, migratory corridor is quite famous and very, good resource for us to have. But I will also point out that the Northwest portion of the state is a super cool area for raptors, um, just to see the mix that can occur there, um, kind of in that Tallgrass Aston Park Williams region. It's right on the edge for some of our species and some of the Western species. So you can get a really good look at birds you might not commonly see um, if you need a prairie falcon for your list or something along those lines, I, I would recommend that area. It's fun to drive around in. Um, lots of birds to see, but you really got to use a scope and binos and, and a lot of patience. Um, <clears throat> one of the guides I, I do like is the cross leg ID guide for raptors. Um, when I first saw it, the cross leg guides, I was a little bit overwhelmed. The, the images are superimposed in all these different um, poses or different morphs. But for raptors, it's such a consolidated group that those images are really helpful. Um, so it's kind of a fun book if you just want to like have a bedside reading or something. It's a fun book to look through for raptor IDs um, in general. Hawkwatch International also has some ID sheets online if you have a specific question about birds that you really, or about raptors that you really want to dig into. And then I can't do uh, it any bit of justice better than Sharon did, but all of the apps that are online or all of the um, online web pages that there are available for bird IDs. There's a ton more than what I listed here. I do have eBird on there. Um, it's really important to contribute your data to eBird, but I also use it for like what was seen where, and I've used it traveling and I'm super excited to, um, use the, the app that uses eBird data because I didn't even know that existed. So that is my um, 
quick and dirty ID and resources. And now I'm gonna jump into a little bit of our research and definitely watch me for time. I can talk about this all day, but I'm gonna to try to make it brief. This is mostly just a heads up about MODIS in the Midwest and some of the research that we're working on now. So um, the Minnesota DNR is partnering with six Midwestern states um, in a collaborative grant to grow the MODIS network. MODIS is a um, radio telemetry. It's automated radio telemetry that is kind of the reverse of what trad traditional radio telemetry is. So usually you put a transmitter on a bird and you carry a receiver around and triangulate where that bird is. This, <clears throat> or you have satellite, which can tell you where that bird is. Um, in this case, we have a stationary receiver and if the bird passes it, you know that the bird was in that area. So we're not necessarily getting site level habitat selection out of this information. It's a lot of migratory information. Depending on how many towers you have in the landscape, you can start to put together a really amazing story about the full life cycle of a bird. <clears throat> and I can put the MODIS network um, link in the chat for you too after this, but just wanted to show you in the US and Canada, North America, this is what the MODIS network look like. looks like. It is well established in the East, and we've got just a big old hole in the Midwest. We are starting, um, NRRI was one of the first in Minnesota to start putting those up, up in Duluth, and they put them all along the um, North Shore. And then we've jumped on board working with NRRI and others to start putting out towers as well. Um, Missouri is a great example, and they're the lead on this. They're the ones that put a nice little fence line. So if we've got birds passing um, Missouri, we, we are typically gonna hear from them. Um, and this research is uh, share sourced so people can have access to the data and all researchers, like if I don't host a tower, I can still put out tags and you can put tags on quite small animals like bats and insects. Um, so it's really revolutionizing radio telemetry and um, learning the tracking and full year life cycle of a lot of different species. So we are working with quite a few partners. Um, the work was funded initially by the Minnesota Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund or LCCMR. Um, we currently have a state wildlife grant and that's when we're um, partnering with six other states. And then I'm partnering with local um, entities as well like Carpenter Nature Center who received a grant from MOU and Tropical Wings to put up their first tower. Um, Carpenter is hosting two stations, Saxon Bog we're working with directly and they're hosting a one station and then Arden Hills Army Training Site, which is right here in the cities is hosting a station and this is a picture of that first station we put up. Um, it's just a big old antenna with a little receiver attached to it. <clears throat> Part of that grant we had to select a species that we wanted to do research on and you may or may not know but kestrels, American kestrels are not doing that great. They have been on the decline for the last couple of decades. And um, the reason isn't completely clear. Loggerhead shrikes are in the same category and we could potentially say, well, it's probably insects, um, but we don't know that for sure. And we wanna figure out kind of where the vulnerabilities are for these birds. Seems to be younger birds and seems to be during migration. Um, so we are using tiny little transmitters. This is what a backpack transmitter looks like and it's solar and it's quite light. Um, and we're attaching them to both adults and juvenile kestrels. Um, so far, we've put them on birds at Carpenter, Arden Hills Army Training Site, and Saxon Bog. Um, and we're just trying to figure out where this vulnerability is in their full annual cycle to see what might be causing some of the kestrels decline. <clears throat> and this is just a super fun slide of all the people that I've worked with on this project and the birds, um, it's just, this bird is the best. It's um, feisty, it's small, it's unique. It's just small enough not to carry a big transmitter, but just big enough to be able to carry these backpacks. Um, we're so far getting quite a lot of information, which has been really fun. So you might recognize some folks in this photo. Jen and Carpenter, and this is the tower that we put up there. We, we actually retrofitted it so it can listen to multiple frequencies. Um, this is a kestrel in the nest box with an antenna sticking off her back or his back. So um, just been a fun project. And that slide is fun to just kind of show all the work that we've done um, through a photographic lens. So 
here's our project update. Um, I really do want to thank uh, Marty and Todd at Carpenter. They were super helpful in putting up all these antennas and nobody lost an eye. Um, just the amount of pokey things up there is difficult enough, let alone the wires that comes off of it. So they've been really helpful in, in doing this project. We've deployed 21 transmitters um, in this last year. We, we did have a pilot season. Most of those transmitters are, are molted out. We did a tail mount first and then switched to backpacks. Um, so likely won't hear from those birds again. We we've had a high rate of de detectability from these birds within the MODIS network in the Midwest and are looking forward to hearing from those birds coming back right now. We've just put the tower back up and Arden Hills. Um, it's got a solar battery, so we have to take it off in the summer or in the winter. <clears throat> and um, these return rates, so if you think of a ping on a MODIS tower as a band recite, these return rates are much higher than what any other banding research has been for kestrels. So just that in and of itself is a really great way of saying this technology is suitable for the questions we're asking and is giving us a lot more information than we've ever had before. Um, it's been really exciting to talk to people in the community about how to research kestrels and the troubles we've had and they've had, um, but it's showing a lot of promise. Like I said, we're in the very beginning of it. <coughs> um, we are, I am heading out after this talk to check our nest boxes and put up a couple new ones at Arden Hills. We're looking forward to hearing from our birds that are returning. Um, I check the tower every other day or so to see what we, if we have any pings. Um, we're planning on deploying 25 more transmitters throughout the state. We, we concentrated mostly in the metro and at Saxon that first year, and we might even be putting a couple transmitters out in Wisconsin as well this year. And we're check, checking our data to um, see what we might be detecting, because we could hear somebody's, you know, insect pass by or a bat or anything on this modus network. And that's the part that's so fun. It's a really big community and really great. And we're also adding partners this year. Lots of folks are helping us out with this project and it's been uh, a really great collaboration.